So uh, as I was as I was saying before, here in my university, which is located in Brazil, we we also have uh, this series of seminars. Here we call it o que é, which is the Portuguese translation to what is, and it has it uh, as I talked to to Elder, it has exactly the same motivation, which is this column in the in the bulletin of the AMS, which is called what is, we, in which people publish uh, some small notes about some interesting object in mathematics that sometimes can help uh, can be used in other areas of mathematics, so. It is with the same motivation that we here have this, this seminar to try to present the tools in mathematics that might be useful to, to other areas. And in this direction, I chose to, to say what is symbolic dynamics. So I expect that there, there are non-experts, people that do not work in dynamical systems in the audience. So I'll try to explain almost everything that's in these slides, okay? Towards the end, I'm going to mention some new results without uh, being very technical, but uh, perhaps it might be a little bit more difficult for those who are not in the field, but uh, I'm taking the, the, the chance to present these results, especially to say that uh, this area of symbolic dynamics is a very active area in mathematics, okay? So uh, I would like to start making a asking a question, which is the following. So what is simpler? A geometrical object, which is called horseshoe. So what is a horseshoe? Horseshoe is this geometrical configuration that was discovered by Ismail in the 1960s, in which you have a dynamics that acts in the neighborhood of a square, rectangle. And the way that the dynamics acts is that the image of this rectangle it is just like this horseshoe here. So you stretch the rectangle vertically, you contract it horizontally, and you pull it back uh, on top of the initial rectangle in this direction here. And I put the letters A and C in different orientation so that you can see how this bending is done. Well, uh, when I ask uh, what is simpler, I could ask you, for instance, well, this induces a dynamics in the neighborhood of this rectangle. And the very first question that we ask in dynamics is, given a dynamical system or given a transformation, does it have fixed points or does it have periodic points? And in case it does, how many periodic points of a certain period do you have? So as you imagine here, seeing this horseshoe as it is in this slide is very hard to see or try to guess whether it has a fixed point. And it's even harder to see whether it has a point of period, let's say 2021. So uh, the simplification tries to go exactly in this direction, trying to undercover what are the dynamical properties of this geometrical object. And in the formulation of the question, I'm going to compare this ge geometrical object with a combinatorial object, which is called the left shift. So what is the left shift? It's also a dynamics, a map acting on a space, but now the space and the map are defined combinatorially. The space is just the sequence of uh, B, the set of B infinite sequences in which each position they are indexed by Z and each position has either the bit zero or the bit one. We call this a symbolic space. And there is a very simple dynamics acting on this space, which is to get a sequence of bits and move, shift it one unit to the left. So if you shift the sequence uh, one unit to the left, you obtain a new sequence and who, here I put the, the dot period to me to, to say that actually the, uh, uh, a shift is happening. So this is the position zero of the initial sequence. And this is the new position zero of the shifted sequence. And well, uh, you might agree with me that it is much simpler from a combinatorial point of view to analyze this second map. Because for instance, how do you generate, well, does it have 
fixed points. Yes, if you put all the bits to be zero or all the bits to be one, then the image of the sequences are the sequences themselves. And more generally, does it have periodic points? Yes, if you fix positions zero, A1, A0, A1 up to AK, and you repeat these positions in the same blocks in the sequence forward and backwards, then this is going to be a periodic point, periodic sequence. So from a combinatorial point of view, it's much easier to see that this map has periodic points in comparison with the horseshoe. But the fact, and this is the, the nice thing that symbolic dynamics does, is that these two maps, they are actually the same. And I put the same into quotes because we have to mean what uh, two mathematical objects, when two mathematical objects are equal. I'm not going to be very specific on this, but I'm going to mention the conclusions that we can get from this e equality between these two dynamical systems. You can, using the combinatorial uh, version, you can do simple inter iterations of the map because you can just get the sequence and shift that one unit to the left. You can count periodic points. As I said, I give examples of periodic point. Every periodic point is made in the way that I claim. So you just have to prescribe the first period, a point of period K, you just have to prescribe the first K positions and repeat these positions in the subsequent blocks. And more on the direction of ergodic theory, you can also identify invariant measures, invariant measures that live in this space and are invariant under the action of the transformation. So using this equality between the horseshoe and the left shift, you can conclude many dynamical properties of the horseshoe by analyzing them in the left shift. And then since these objects are equal, pulling these properties back to the horseshoe. So this is the underlying idea that symbolic dynamics allows you to do. And the goal of this talk is first to discuss, to discuss how these two objects are the same. So how, how do you pass from one geometrical object, just like the horseshoe, to a symbolic object, just like the left chip? And this is going to be exactly through the topic of my talk, through the tool that is called symbolic dynamics. And towards the end, I'm going to try to mention some recent developments in this field. Uh, whenever you have questions, uh, you can just uh, stop me or uh, put your microphone and speak or write in the chat, okay? Okay, so how we, we proceed in this discussion? So first of all, I'm going to give you some very simple examples on how we can implement this representation of these geometrical systems in terms of these symbolic systems. And towards the end of the examples, I'm going to try to increase the level of complexity of the examples until we get to a very interesting example, which is called the cat map. So then we are going to discuss uh, the cat map, which is a genuinely uniformly hyperbolic system that is usually studied by in, in, in undergraduate and graduate studies in dynamical systems and understanding this example is going to allow us to extrapolate and to see how we construct symbolic dynamics in more complicated situations. And then I'm going to mention some literature in the field. And the third part is finally going to be mentioning the recent results that we have in the area. Okay, so the very first example that I'm going to mention is the binary expansion, which I associate here with a map, which is called 2x mod 1. So 2x mod 1 is exactly what you expect. You get a point. It, it is easily defined in the interval 0, 1 as follows. You get a point x. You multiply it by 2, and you consider its fractional part. So you subtract. You, it's going to be 2x if the x is between 0 and half. And that's why the graph is just the, this uh, segment here. And it's going to be 2x minus 1 if x is between 1 half and 1 because if x is between one half and one, two x is greater than one. So you have to subtract one to pull it back to the interval zero and zero one. 
And why is this uh, binary? Why is this map uh, related to by to the binary expansion? Well, as you can see, if a point belongs to this first interval, you can conclude that the first number in the bin in its binary expansion is zero, and if it belongs to the second interval, oops, you can conclude that it's first number in its binary expansion is one. So by identifying whether the point belongs to this interval or this interval, you can understand what is its first uh, digit in the binary expansion. And well, if you can do this, you can, how do you understand what is the second digit in the binary expansion and the third and the fourth and so on? The idea is now to apply the map and see where the trajectory of the point is going to fall either in this interval or in this interval. So from a geometrical point of view, understanding what is the trajectory of the point, you can understand a number theoretical pr uh, property, which is the numbers in the binary expansion of some number. And that's why I put that the binary expansion is related to the 2x mod one. And our goal, is to, since this has also uh, uh, beyond an intrinsic motivation in dynamics, it has a number theoretical motivation by being related to, to this binary expansion, we want to understand how to e more easily represent this map here. For instance, we can ask the same questions as we did for the horseshoe. Does this map has fixed points? Yes, it does, zero is a fixed point. Does this map has points of period 2021? Well, this is now a more complicated question. Well, but it does. If you if you start to, to, to iterate and see what is the graph of F to the power 20, 21, you're going to see a bunch of branches going coming from zero to one here, blah, 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 blah. And to see a periodic point of period 21, 20, 21, is to see whether this graph of the power F to 20, 21 intersects the diagonal and it certainly will intersect because each branch starts in the horizontal axis and comes until the line here one. So this is and this is easy. But more complicated is to understand how many of these periodic points you have. And one way to do this is through symbolic dynamics in which we are going to associate to each point of the interval a sequence of numbers, zero and one. Actually here is a, almost a tautology because you are going to get the point and you are going to associate a sequence of digits in the, in the binary expansion. But when you see from a geometrical perspective, you see that, well, let's say how we, we, we do this uh, sort of uh, passage from the geometrical model to the symbolic model. As we saw, what is important is to see whether the point and its iterates fall into the first half or the second half of the unit interval. So we call this I0 and Y1. X belongs to I0 if its first digit is zero. X belongs to I1 if its first digit in the binary expansion is one. So when you take X belonging to zero one, you have, you have this, just like uh, I said, where A1 is the first digit in the binary expansion of the point. And by applying the dynamics, you get F of X. So you can see whether F of X belongs to I0 or I1 and the index of the interval to which it belongs to is exactly the second digit in its binary expansion. And you repeat the algorithm. Well, now we will try to discuss the symbolic dynamics. And as I said, the symbolic model for this uh, very simple dynamical system here is almost a tautology because it's going to be exactly its uh, sequence in the binary expansion. And that's why, in this case, the symbolic space is going to be the second, this set of one-sided sequences with bits zero and one. But when we see in this way, we can consider a dynamics, which is the dynamics of the left shift. In this case, since it's only one-sided, the action of this dynamics in one sequence is to forget about the zero position and push all the remaining positions, one unit to the left. And well, uh, by means of this uh, dynamics and the symbolic space, you can actually associate 
to each sequence of zeros and ones a real point from the interval zero one by trying to prescribe exactly what is its trajectory. So if you get a sequence here in sigma a1, a2, and an, pi of the sequence is going to be a point which at time zero belongs to i a1, time two, time one, do, time one belongs to i a2, time three belongs to i a3, and so on. And well, if the nth iterate of the point has to belong to i a n, the point itself has to belong to f minus n of i a n, so it has to belong to this intersection. So there is a natural way of trying to define this, this map, which from now on I will call a codification. So why is this a codification? Because you are to each, or it can be seen either as a codification or a decodification, it depends on the taste that you have, but it is going from a sequence of symbols and associating a point. And the property is that this point is following exactly the itinerary prescribed by the code, by the sequence of symbols. And well, why is this map uh, properly defined? And here is the reason. The reason is that the map f of x equals to 2x mod 1 is a map that has derivative equal to two everywhere. So things are expanding. And if things are expanding, the inverse image contracts uh, in sizes of intervals. So you can actually see this intersection as a decreasing intersection of compact sets. And by the counter theorem, this has, this is not only non-empty, but it also has, uh, it consists of a single point. And that's the, the, the way that from a dynamical property in the sense that you have expansion, and this is said to us by the fact that the derivative of the map is bigger than one, you can conclude that this codification is well-defined. And now it is very good because, uh, well, this codification is exactly what allows you to go from this simple dynamical system, which is the left shift, to the not so simple, but yet still very simple, geometrical dynamical system, which is f of x equals to 2x mod 1. And the way that I say that these two systems are the same is exactly that this map pi, it commutes the action of the left shift sigma and the action of 2x mod 1. So you have a commutative diagram. And so dynamical properties of one, that the one that are on the top, are related to dynamical properties of the one that are on the bottom. And moreover, if you can understand when this map pi is not an injection, so if you can understand the set of points in which it, the map is not injective, you can also understand properties that you have in 2x mod 1 and pull it in, in, and push it or pull it back to the left shift. So there is actually a two-way direction that you can relate the left shift here with the geometrical model, okay? So this is the first example. It is very simple from, uh, from a number theoretical perspective because we just associate to a point its binary expansion, but there, there are uh, some other situations you can, in which you can proceed exactly as in the same way that are slightly more complicated. And this is, for instance, associated with this map here, g of x equals to one of x mod one. So the graph of this map, what it is, well, the graph of one of x is a hyperbola. And then you have to pull it back, the graph of the hyperbola to the unit interval. So you pull it back in pieces. So the first piece comes back as this uh, curve here. The second piece comes back as this curve here. The third piece comes back as this curve here. And we actually know exactly what are the intervals associated with this. Are the inverses of the natural numbers. And this map is uh, very much related with the continued, continued fracture expansion of a number. Exactly in the same way that we consider the 2x mod 1. Because as you see, 
how will you understand what is the first entry in the continued fraction expansion of a number? You just locate to which of these intervals it belongs to. If it belongs to this first one, its first entry is one. If it belongs to the second one is two. If it belongs to the third one is three and so on. So by geometrically locating the point, you understand what is the first entry. And if you want to understand all entries, then you do as we did before. You iterate the method. So that's the reason that I say that one of X mod one, it generates the continued fractions expansion if you see what is the trajectory of a point under this dynamical system. And well, exactly as we did uh, before, we can also construct a symbolic space in which you have this left shift acting and we can construct a codification, a coding map pi that relates the symbolic space with gx equals to one of x mod, uh, mod one. So you do exactly as uh, we did here with the difference that this symbolic space is no longer just going to be the sequence of zero one uh, sequences, the set of zero one sequences, but you have to allow every natural number to appear. So it's going to be n raised to the power n. But all the rest here, you proceed exactly as we did for 2x mod one. Well, these are uh, two uh, number theoretical motivations that uh, compel us to, to try to proceed with the symbolic dynamics in, in, a, in a more uh, schematic way. Before going to the, to the example that I'm really interested in, which is the cat map, I should also mention an example that is very easy in probability, which is that of Markov chains. A Markov chain is, uh, you can see uh, by being generated by an oriented graph. So here, for instance, you have uh, this example of this graph. And inside this graph, you can look at all paths that it has. And this gives uh, rise to a symbolic space as well. So the paths on a graph, if you index them by Z, it constitutes a symbolic space in which you can also define a dynamics, which is the left shift. So if you have a sequence, you push all positions one unit to the left, you obtain a new sequence. And from a physical perspective, this is just to get a path on the graph and to evolve this path on time. So the position zero get good. Position one goes to position zero. So it's just like you having a particle following this path. And when you apply the left chip, you see where the particle is located at time one, at time two, at time three, and so on. And well, this is intrinsically a symbolic space. And I focus on this because it is very easy to see one important property that this space has. And the property is called the Markov property. So the Markov property in our context, from a graph theoretical point of view, or from the point of view of Markov chains, as I'm saying, simply says something that's very obvious. If you have a path that starts at vertex A and goes to a vertex B, and if you also have a path that starts at vertex B and goes to vertex C, then you can concatenate the paths and get a new path that starts at vertex A and goes to vertex C. This might be very simple as I am saying now, but it is the underlying idea that allows us to construct the symbolic dynamics for a wide class of systems, okay? This wide class of systems, uh, I already mentioned two of them. As you saw, both of them essentially uh, have derivative greater than one and derivative greater than one in the one dimensional situation means that you have expansion. But in a general context, you might have some eigenvalues which are bigger than one and this actually means expansion. And you might have some eigenvalues which are smaller than one. And this on the contrary means that you have contraction. And if a map a dynamical system only has eigenvalues some of them bigger than one and some of them smaller than one, that is, that is none of them is equal to one, then we are in a situation that is very classical in dynamics called uniform 
hyperbolicity. So uniform hyperbolicity means that you have hyperbolicity. And what is hyperbolicity is having expansion in some directions and contractions in other directions. And uniform means that you actually see this expansion and this contraction every time that you iterate the map. This is a class of uh, models that was widely studied since the 1920s by, the, by means of geodesic flows in manifolds of negative sectional curvature. And it, it was further studied by the Russian and the American schools of dynamics in the 1960s by Anozov, Smeo, uh, well, I'm going to forget names, so I'm going only to mention more Sinai and many others. And well, this is a very restricted class. It turned out that it's very hard for a system to be uniform hyperbolicity. And since the 90s, people started to create new ways of uniform of hyperbolicity that are easier to hold. So weaker notions of hyperbolicity. And among them, you have one that is called non-uniform hyperbolicity. And this name, non-uniform hyperbolicity, let me come back to you. This name, non-uniform hyperbolicity is somewhat misleading because you think that the thing is, is, is not hyperbolic at all, but it is hyperbolic, but the hyperbolicity occurs in a non-uniform way, meaning that you might not have expansion and contraction at every iteration of the map, but only on the average, if you allow time to go to infinity. And when you say about on the average, you start to say about Lyapunov exponents. So no uniform hyperbolicity means that the Lyapunov exponents of a map are different from zero. So that's all I'm going to say about these classes. And why am I saying about these classes? Because in all of the examples that we're going to discuss from now on, and also of the constructions of symbolic dynamics that I'm going to mention, we restrict ourselves to either uniformly hyperbolic or non-uniformly hyperbolic models, systems. And well, I'm saying this because the world of symbolic dynamics is actually much bigger than just restricted to this class of models. You have other types of symbolic dynamics that are also very interesting on their own, but unfortunately I'm not going to discuss them here, okay? So coming back, to this class of systems that I mentioned that I want to focus on, we are going to discuss this classical one, which is called the cat map. So what is the cat map? You have here this two by two matrix, two, one, one, one. It has uh, integer entries and determinant equal to one. So it naturally projects down to a map on the two torus. And when you try to understand what it does on the two torus, well, it's hard for us to imagine the two torus, so we usually imagine it through a fundamental domain. So we get the usual fundamental domain. And well, if you put the cat here and try to understand what is the image of the cat, what happens? Well, if you just apply the matrix in the plane to the fundamental domain, you're gonna have a parallelogram here. This is the action on the plane, but since we have a map acting on the two torus, we have to pull back the pieces that are outside of the fundamental domain back to the fundamental domain. So by pulling this, this piece here, one unit to the left, it comes here and you do the same with the two other pieces. And the conclusion is that what this map F does in the torus or at least with the cat is that it gets the cat here and it stretches the cat around the torus in some way to get this complicated figure here. And well, you might agree that this, uh, some of you might not agree that this is that complicated, but if I ask you to iterate this again, then it's going to be a much more complicated picture, which is if actually hard to draw. So how are we able to understand the dynamics of this very simple map, because it's defined by a two by two matrix in the two torus. And here we are going to use the symbolic dynamics. So what is the motivation to construct the symbolic dynamics in this simple example? Well, as you see, uh, the map is 
complicated to understand as we did because we have the fundamental domain here and it stretches in one direction this direction is actually if you calculate the eigenvalues of the two by two matrix you're going to get one eigenvalue bigger than one and as i said this corresponds to expansion stretching things and another eigenvalue is smaller than one and this corresponds to contracting things so the image of the of the unit square is going to be something that gets more stretched in the expanding direction and gets contracted in the contracting direction and it seems very complicated because in, because for instance this vertical line goes to the diagonal here and this horizontal line goes to this uh line here which has a uh, angle whose tangent is one over two so it's not this this these lines corresponding to the boundary of this fundamental domain they are not invariant and they actually they start on the further and further iteration that they start to get more and more aligned to this direction that gets expanded so you have no invariance at all of the boundaries of this fundamental domain when you start to iterate it itself and this is, makes it much a very complicated to understand the map so what is the great idea that was developed in this context of this matrix by uh, Roy Adler and Benji Weiss in the 1960s. They said, well, the reason that this map seems complicated is because we are looking at the right, uh, at the wrong system of coordinates. The right system of coordinates that we should look at is the system of coordinates given by the eigendirections because they have a dynamical meaning they are invariant so what we try we try to do instead of considering the plane with the usual lattice that induces the fundamental domain that we usually consider the two torus we should try to look for a dynamical lattice a way of tiling the plane using pieces that are dynamically relevant for this matrix and by dynamically relevant I mean that the boundary of the fundamental domain should be parallel to these eigendirections, which are invariant. So they showed that this is possible. And here is one way of doing this. So each piece L-shaped figure here is a fundamental domain of the two torus, and their boundaries are parallel to the eigendirections of the matrix. So here, I just uh, pull it without the previous one. But to see that this is actually a fundamental domain is very easy. You just have to reassemble what is outside of the original fundamental domain back to it. And you see that this, this, uh, this L-shaped figure is actually a fundamental domain. And how did they use this dynamically relevant fundamental domain to understand the dynamics of the cat map? They said, well, let's see how uh, the map acts on this fundamental domain. And for simplification, I'm going to divide the fundamental domain into two rectangles, this pink one and this gray one. And when you iterate, you see that at least at the level of the, of the plane, the image of this fundamental domain is here. So you have a red rectangle and it's image of the pink one. So as you see, uh, it contracts in the contracting direction and it expands in the other direction. And the same thing happens with the gray, whose image, at least in R2, is this. And one nice feature is that la uh, uh, boundaries of the rectangles go to lines which are parallel to the original one, because everything is done in the eigendirections. So the image of something in the eigendirection is also in the eigendirection. So you preserve parallel lines using these rectangles. And that is also a much more interesting property, which I'm going to mention to you in a while. But here you should understand that in order to, to see what is the map doing for the two torus, you should imagine that what it does, the image of this left rectangle, it crosses the this fundamental domain from left to right 
So it crosses the, the pink rectangle itself and it crosses the gray rectangle here. And the gray one, it actually crosses two copies of the fundamental domain. So this means that it crosses the, it crosses itself twice, one in this piece and another in this other piece, and it crosses the pink one once here. And well, well we dynamics don't like don't like twice crossings. So to avoid this twice crossing, what we actually do is to subdivide the gray into two sub rectangles, a gray one and a blue one, such that now you no longer have multiple crossings. So the gray, the image of the gray now only crosses it once, and the image of the blue crosses the pink one once, and it crosses the gray, and it crosses itself once. So no more double crossings. And once you have this picture here, you can then apply the main idea of symbolic dynamics. And the main idea of symbolic dynamics is to give a simple representation of the orbits of a system that you are interested in. How? Instead of describing what is the sequence of locations of points, so instead of specifically saying to me what x is, what f of x is, what f2 of x is, you just give me a coding. And this coding is the sequence of rectangles that these points are visiting. So if the point first visited starts in the pink, goes to the gray, then to the blue, then I'm going to associate this sequence, gray, pink, pink, gray, and blue, and so on. And using this association, you can uh, represent every trajectory of the cat map by means of paths on a graph. What is the graph? The graph is going to be uh, a graph whose vertices are exactly the rectangles. And the edges in the graph are going to be the possible intersections that you have after one iteration. So why is there an edge coming from the pink to itself, a loop in the pink uh, vertex? Well, because the pink rectangle crosses itself once it is iterated. So the image of the pink crosses the pink, so I put an edge here. Why is there an edge blue from, from blue to gray here? Well, because when you look at the image of blue, which is here, it crosses the gray. So you should, you should remember that the gray here is in this fundamental domain as well. So uh, by the edges of the graph, you represent all possible transitions of rectangles after one iteration. And in particular, every trajectory under the cat map can be represented by a trajectory, a path on the graph. And well, this is nice, but it is not as nice as we want because usually what we want is to do the reverse direction. Is now that we have this graph, we want to consider a path on this graph and associate to it a real orbit of the cat map. So we want to do the reverse thing, getting a path on the graph. How can we associate a point that is indeed following the trajectory prescribed by this path? And here is where the Markov property is very important because the Markov property says that we can, well, at, at the level of the graph, that we can concatenate edges to generate a path. So we should have some geometrical meaning for this possible concatenation in terms of the rectangles. And the property is that the way that you subdivide your, your fundamental domain should be in a way that the rectangles satisfy a geometrical Markov property. And the geometrical Markov property is that they have to satisfy a crossing property. What is this crossing property? Is that whenever they, a rectangle, when iterated, intersects another one, it has to intersect all the way from left to right or all the way from top to bottom. So here is an allowed intersection because the image of the red actually went from the left boundary of S to the right boundary of S. But here is a forbidden intersection because the image of R intersected the left boundary of S, but did not intersect the right boundary of S. So 
once you have this Markov property for the rectangles, then you can actually concatenate edges in the associated graph in the sense that every path in the graph is going to be associated to a real trajectory of the geometrical model. And once you do this, you are done because you, you got a symbolic representation of your system. What is the symbolic representation of your system? Well, or either the symbolic dynamics is going to be the symbolic model that I was describing before. So you have a symbolic space, which is the paths on a graph. What is the graph? The graph, its vertices are the rectangles that you subdivide your original geometrical space, and the edges are the possible transitions under one iteration. So you're going to draw an edge from a rectangle to another one if the image of the first intersects the second. And in this symbolic space, you have the usual left shift that we have been talking since the beginning of this talk. And finally, you also have a coding map, which does exactly what we wanted. It associates a path on the graph to a real point on the two torus. And how does it does? How does it do? It does exactly as we want. We want that the, the, the point associated, its trajectory follows exactly the sequence of rectangles of the path. So there is no escape. We have to define it in this way. And the fact is that this definition due to the Markov property is actually non-empty. So I just repeated what the definition of this coding map is, but the, the, the overall conclusion is that this Markov property from the level of graphs, we can concatenate edges from the level of sets on the geometry. This intersection is non-empty. This is important for us to define this map by. And also the uniform hyperbolicity of the cat map. So the expansion and contraction that it has, it, it has also implies that this intersection here can be written as a decreasing intersection of closed sets whose diameters are converging to zero. So it's actually a unitary intersection and this really defines the coding coming, getting a sequence, a path on a graph and associated a point in the tutorials. And this is great because just like in the beginning, we can conclude that our cat map and our left shift on that graph that I, that I showed you to you three slides ago, they are the same. And they are the same in the sense that this map by here commutes this diagram. And since it commutes this diagram and it also has some very nice injectivity properties, we can understand some dynamical properties of the cat map by understanding them in the left shift and projecting out via the map by to the geometrical model, okay? So this is the underlying idea of symbolic dynamics that I, I recall to you, I'm doing it in the context uh, in which the original geometrical dynamical system has some hyperbolic properties. And this has a long standing history. Ah, let me just uh, mention to you that this example is very nice, but it, it is also very misleading. Because as you saw, we were able to obtain these rectangles to make all the construction just using some Euclidean rectangles. And everything is very nice. It's very simple. They are really Euclidean rectangles and so on. But if you try to do this in higher dimensions, then things get much more complicated. And actually, if you get some Three, dime, three by three matrix, which is also hyperbolic. Bowen, Rufus Bowen, which was a, a, an American mathematician, proved in the 1970s that there are examples of three by three matrices in which there is no simple geometrical partition made of these rectangles in the two dimensional situation. They are going to be parallelograms. And what do I mean by this? You cannot find the, the, the partition by means of parallelograms, because usually the division that you do, the boundary of the, of the division is not going to be smooth at all. It's going to be made of fractal sets. So even in dimension three for a linear map, things can get really nasty. 
And that's where people start to do this, constru this construction in a more delicate way. Okay, so this concludes uh, my explanation on how you use uh, this Markov property and how you construct symbolic uh, dynamics for some simple geometrical models. So do we have any questions so far? Yuri? Yes? May I ask a question? Sure. So uh, so in that coding you have presented us, uh, how do you handle uh, points whose orbits are in the boundary of the partition? Exactly. So when they are in the boundary of partition is places where uh, you lose injectivity. Okay, okay. Okay. So but pi, so pi is, is, is not uh, surjective. Pi, pi is surjective because pi comes from uh paths and goes to points so there are there are traject there are paths on the graph which project to points in the boundary of the partition ah, okay but, but there are more more there is there are there is more than one path that projects to the same point okay yes. and, and and if we uh, use another matrix instead of that two one 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 the technique would be the same yes work? if Yes, if it's a two by two matrix, you can do the same. Okay, and so uh, this is the construction of uh, Adler and Weiss. And when you go to dimension three, what is the let's say the the profound problem that prevents the the things to stay in the level of parallelograms? So the simple explanation is as follows: in dimension three. Well, we have a hyperbolic matrix. So you have, let's say that you have uh, the contracting direction is one dimensional and the expanding direction is two dimensional, okay? Yes. If you want, if you want a rectangle, now a parallel, a parallelepiped, uh, the, the boundary of the parallelepiped is going to be two dimensional. Okay? Mm -hmm. Being two dimensional, you are not, some of them, cannot be just made of single uh, directions that are associated to the eigenvalue smaller than one. Because here, some of them were associated to the eigenvalue smaller than one, to the contracting direction, two of them, and two were associated to the expanding one. In dimension three, you are going to have some faces which are actually expanding directions, but some of them are not just single contracting directions. They have to be made of many contracting directions altogether. And the dynamics acting on these contracting directions is what makes this uh, phase to be a non-fractal one. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you a lot. So Mubarak, Mubarak mm -hmm. Muhammad also raised the hand. Hello. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so I, I want to ask, um, like in the one dimensional case, um, can we build, uh, can we have this uh, kind of structure? Uh, can we build, do we have like this kind of symbolic dynamics or maps that have maybe some kind of discontinuities and maybe um, points with um, unbounded derivative or a kind of uh, points whose derivative is zero? So can we build this kind of, uh, can we have this symbolic dynamics on such systems? No, yes. Okay. Yes. Can I answer your question in 10 seconds? Sure. <laughs> because now uh, I'm going to mention that there is a huge literature in this in this business that, as right. I said, you remember to interrupt. You also, we also have a question in the chat. Anthony Sanchez is asking, okay. is the matrix for the three torus easy to write? Yes. It is very easy. It, it also has integer entries and a determinant equal to one. Okay, so it's in the paper of Rufus Bowen, which is called Markov Partitions Are Not Smooth. You can you can easily find on Math Sign. Great. Okay, so uh, coming back here and going the direction of answering the uh, the question of Muhammad Bubarak. So there is a huge literature in, in dealing with constructions of symbolic dynamics in the context that I mentioned to you, uniform hyperbolicity and non-uniform hyperbolicity, which, well, it's, uh, 
covered in this table. I'm not going to discuss this, this table, but I'm only going to mention that the first result that went on the for that worked for non-uniform hyperbolic systems was made by Katok in 1980. But it has some uh, problems because it was not able to code the whole dynamics at once. And this was soaked by uh, Omri Sarik uh, more than 30 years after Katok. So Omri Sarik for two dimensional diffeomorphisms, he was able actually to, to get this codification, the symbolic dynamics for, for, the, dyna for the whole dynamics of uh, diffeomorphism in a surface. And since then, the methods of study are being further developed. And I highlighted here the ones in red, which are the ones that I am uh, associated to. So uh, with Sarig, we are able to extend his, uh, his coding, his, his method for three-dimensional flows without fixed points. And later on with Carlos Mateus, we, are, we were able to handle it, to handle planar billiards. And planar billiards, uh, Mohammed, they are maps that are not globally defined and there are points where the derivative explodes. So this is a first occurrence of a possible explosion of derivative in which we have to redo all the theory of Sarig in order to, to obtain this result with, with much finer uh, uh, estimates and many other things that we needed to handle to, to, to make the, the, the general idea to work. And more recently, in 2020, uh, well, this is the year of publication of the paper, I handled the situation of one-dimensional maps. And I allow the maps either to have critical points, derivative equal to zero, and also to have discontinuities. Okay, so yes, it applies to this context that you asked. It is included partially in the paper with Mateus in planar billiards, and in the one-dimensional situation in this paper of mine that was published last year. And even more recently, there is a preprint that we released last semester. It is in collaboration with Emerson Araujo and Mauricio Poletti, in which we are able, in some sense, to summarize all the results since Sarig. We are actually able to, to under a very general framework, to recover the, the original result of Sarig and also the extension of his students, Nibio Benovade, to higher dimensions, but also to recover the result for planar billiards, for one dimensional maps. And we go beyond because we are also able to handle multi dimensional billiards and also general non invertible maps, not only one dimensional. And it, it is more or less in this direction that I want to mention the, the final two results here in the talk. And the final two results, they are actually related to, to a problem that Rufus Bowen left in his notebook. So for those of you who do not know, Rufus Bowen was a brilliant mathematician. He was a student of Smail, and he died suddenly at the age of 32. So he has a, a, a huge uh, uh, mathematical contribution. Some people say that he could even get the Fields Medal. Well, I do not know about politics, but uh, it is certain that he, he, he made a revolution in the theory of dynamical systems. And after he suddenly died at this age, people found a notebook that he left in which he wrote some questions that he was interested in or thought that they were interesting. And the problem number 17 of his, uh, of his notebook was exactly to get symbolic dynamics or billiards. And this was solved by me and Mateus in the two dimensional situation and with Araujo and Pauletti in the higher dimensional situation. So this is what I'm going to mention now. And well, I am not, I, I will not have time and I didn't uh, have uh, the plan to define properly what a dynamical billiard is. So instead of that, I just put a bunch of examples here to try to, to, to explain what they are. So a dynamical billiard is just a billiard table as we are used to, but this billiard table can be very weird. It can be a billiard table in the two torus, in which you have some obstacles here. And the dynamics on these tables is just to get a point particle. You point it in one direction and you move it at unit speed. And whenever you hit some obstacle, you, ref you get reflected in a specular way. 
So here in the tutorials, for instance, for this billiard table, this point particle hits this obstacle here, and then it comes here. So you remember that you, you are in the tutorial, so you continue the, the trajectory here, and then you hit this obstacle here again, and so on, and so on, and so on. So there is a huge literature about billiard tables. These are, for instance, known as Sinai or dispersing billiards. These other ones are known as Bunimovic billiards. And all of them that are, that are shown here, they exhibit some sort of hyperbolicity. These ones, these previous ones, they actually have some sort of uniform hyperbolicity. And these later ones, they have some sort of no uniform, no uniform hyperbolicity, which means the outcome of exponents different from zero. And whenever you have this kind of systems with this, this hyperbolicity, you expect them to be very chaotic. And actually, I'm going to show to you a video of uh, billiard in the Bunimovic in, in, a, in a stadium. So as you see here, you have a, a, a table in the shape of a stadium. And this, this uh, red parallelogram is a bunch of point particles performing the trajectory in the billiard without interaction. So I'm just putting them all together here so that you can see how chaotic the system is because they are going to start all together almost in the same point, the same position. But after some hits with the table, they are going to be spread all over the table. Just look at the video. And this is actually showing that uh, it's really what you expect once you have some sort of hyperbolicity. You have some sensitivity to initial conditions, some sort of uh, chaos theory in which if you perform small changes in the original state, well, these small changes propagates to big changes in the long run. And this is exactly what is happening here. All the point particles were all together in the beginning, but after some hits, they, they are spreading all over the billiard table. Okay? All right. So continuing my talk. The result is that with Carlos Mateus, if we have a billiard table that's sufficiently regular in the sense that its boundary is piecewise C3, then you can construct symbolic dynamics as I was explaining to you since the beginning. There is this technical thing here that, well, symbolic dynamics is usually related uh, in our context to measures. So we have to say what class of measures we are interested in and or which class of measures we are able to get the symbolic dynamics. And the measures that we are able is are the ones that are called adapted. Well, if you want, I can say a few words about adaptedness after I finish the talk. But this is the result. It says that even in these very complicated uh, models, not very complicated, very simply explained models, but yet very complicated as you saw in the video, you have the same symbolic dynamics that we had in the previous examples in the beginning of the talk. And finally, uh, I finished the talk with the result in the multidimensional situation. So here are just three examples of multidimensional billiards. This one is in the, in the three-dimensional torus in which you have this obstacle here at the center and another obstacle placed at the vertex. So it subdivides into eight sub of obstacles when you see in the fundamental domain. And you can consider as usual a point particle here going in a straight line until it hits any of these obstacles. It gets reflected specular in, in the plane that it defines with the normal and so on. So these uh, are multidimensional versions of some of the billiards that I put two slides ago, and they are much more complicated to understand. So I should mention that there is a huge literature in billiards in dimension two, but when you go to billiards in dimension three or more, things get nasty. But yet we are able to get the same result that we had with Carlos Mateus. This is a joint work with uh, Ernesto Araújo and Maurício Poletti that again, if the boundary of the table is PCI C3 and the measure is adapted, then you can construct the symbolic dynamics and in particular, what is what, what can you get? You can count periodic points. What are periodic points in the billiard? Is a point with a direction that starts at a, at a place, hits the boundary exactly n times, 
and returns to the same position it started exactly with the same direction it started with. So from a geometrical point of view, this is very complicated to try to create at least one, but from the symbolic dynamical point of view, once we have the symbolic dynamics, we have many of these periodic trajectories. And with this, I finish my talk and I thank you all for uh, being here. Many thanks, Yuri. Great, great talk. Before asking for more questions, there is one in the chat by Ibrahim. What happened when the eigenvalue is one? Oh, when the eigenvalue is one, then it 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 is uh, related to a different class of hyperbolicity, which is called partial hyperbolicity, because you're going to have what are called central directions or neutral directions. So things are not, at least from a symbolic point of view, they are not, I don't believe that you are able to do using these methods, uh, symbolic uh, dynamics for when the eigenvalue is equal to one. I don't know if someone has something to, to ask to Yuri or some question, comment. Uh, hey, Yuri, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, so you need to specify a measure. The, the main purpose is to say, uh, to, to specify almost everywhere, right? You, you want to have a coding that is, has full measure. That's, the, that's why you need a, a specifier measure. Uh, yes and no, because what we actually do is that we, we are able to code a set of points with some hyperbolicity. Without, me, without mentioning the measure, we say, this point is good if uh, its Lyapunov exponent is bigger than some threshold and it has some other additional properties. And when you have the measure, uh, when your measure is adapted, it is supported by the set of points that I am able to code. So as a byproduct of my result, I can get the result for measures, but the result itself uh, does not claim measures. It constructs a set of points with some properties on its hyperbolic uh, uh, features that we are able to code. I see, thanks. I don't know if someone wants to ask something. I have one question, Yuri. In, your, in these recent papers, uh, do you get some explicit partition of, of the phase space or the, or the results are more um, uh, abstract existence? Yes, the, unfortunately, they are very abstract. Uh, we don't know the partitions are usually, the, the partition elements are usually fractal sets. Uh, we have no control on their boundaries. And also I should mention that the number of partition elements is usually infinite. It's usually countable. It's no longer finite, just like we had in the case of the cat map, we, where we could uh, code using only three rectangles. Okay, so you have a more complicated setup, and the consequence is that you have a more complicated object to code the setup. Yeah, it will be uh, tremendous if you get an algorithm for a partition in all these scenarios at the same time. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> so far, we are not able to. <laughs> I don't know if there are some more questions or comments. Well, if not, I would like to thank Yuri again for this excellent talk. It was really a nice start for these seminars. And thank you all for coming. I will stop the record now.